Have you heard about Global Poker? Global Poker is the fastest growing card room in the US today, and it's available online at globalpoker.com. Global Poker is a social poker site that offers safe and secure cash out options by using their unique and patented sweepstakes model. Players can compete in big guaranteed tournaments, jackpot sit and goes, or cash games featuring Hold'em, Omaha, and even Crazy Pineapple. Don't wait. Check out Global Poker today. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. Uh, today I present to you episode number 84, featuring one of poker's most well-known voices, David Tuckman. Uh, if you've watched any decent amount of poker in the last uh, decade plus or so, then you've undoubtedly have heard David at some point, whether it was on camera or calling the action from a commentator's booth. Tuckman started out in LA with Bart Hansen doing Live at the Bike. He then worked Full Tilt's million dollar cash game and started doing work for Poker Stars while he was living in London and covering the NFL and NASCAR for Sky Sports. In 2011, he started working with the World Series of Poker and has called the action for the live stream every summer since. Uh, I mean, because of these often marathon final tables he covers, Tuck has most likely called more hands of poker than anybody else in history. But did you know that before his career in sports broadcasting, Tuck tried to make it in Hollywood as an actor? There were a few close calls, and he does have an IMDb page with half a dozen credits, but ultimately it was poker where he found his sweet spot. Still, we did get into some fun stories about his time on the screen, including shows like Beverly Hills 90210, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and Party of Five, and even a big movie that he was cut out of. Anyway, that's enough intro. Here's my conversation with David Tuckman. I am here with the one and only David Tuckman. How are you doing, David? Uh, I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, I was thinking about your name. I mean, it's, did anybody ever call you Dave, David growing up? I mean, with a name like Tuckman, you're just you're just going to be drawn to nicknames, I'm guessing. Yeah, generally my friends call me Tuck. I, it's actually kind of endearing to me. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that when somebody starts calling me Tuck, it reminds me of my childhood and instantly endears me to that person. Uh, there's only one person in the world who gets away with calling me Davey. Davey? That is, yeah, I don't like that. That is, uh, that is FBT. Mm -hmm. He always calls me Davey, and <laughs> he can get away with it because I love him. That is uh, Greg Mueller, full-blown tilt. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was on this podcast, so listeners out there, check it out. A lot of funny Phil Helmuth stories on that one. Yeah, he's a good guy. I like him. So, uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, occasionally it's Dave or David. My wife calls me Dave. She has David. that right. She does not call me <laughs> Tuck, um, but Tuck is generally what I go by. Friar Tuck? Uh, Friar Tuck was... The Tuck Man? Yeah, I've never... You know, Friar Tuck was kind of... Uh, it's not something I did, but I think when I did Live at the Bike way back in the day, somebody called me that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's my two plus two handle. Got it. I believe, but I've never really used it. It wasn't like a, a nickname based out of your... Yeah, no, nobody ever called me Friar Conservative Tuck Conservative nature. Up. Yeah, nobody ever called me that. Yeah, nobody ever called me that, but it was uh, something that kind of came out as I got older. All right, so grew up in New York. Yeah. Uh, where in New York? Uh, basically Long Island area. Okay. My mother's from Bayshore. Okay, So there I have the, uh, the roots. Yeah, I mean, I've been there. a little bit everywhere. Uh, like, I was born in Queens. I lived in upstate for a little bit. Mm -hmm. and and you went to school in Albany, right? I went to school at Hamilton College and Albany both. Okay. And, uh, yeah, my wife's from upstate New York and everything, but I spent, uh, I spent some of my time upstate and then many of my formative years in like Long Island, Queens area. And what were you getting into as a kid? I'm brothers, sisters. I have an older sister. Okay. And what were you getting into? Uh, I played like an ungodly amount of hockey. Yeah. Like that was basically like well, you took were over a, my a life. standout, right? Huh? You had a shot at 
doing something in hockey, right? I, I don't know. I mean, I probably not, to be honest. You're I mean, wearing I, a hockey shirt right now. I am wearing a hockey shirt right now. <laughs> this is a Christmas gift. Peter Puck, for any of you hockey fans out there. It's a great <laughs> book. Um, but, yeah, no, I wouldn't say. I mean, I played college hockey. Mm-hmm. Um, I started at a young age, and I was – I was good, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, um, um, but, you know, after college, like, I had a couple of, like, minor chances to play, like, low, low, low minor leagues, and that pretty much would have been it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I still play now. I coach now. My kid plays. I love the game. If I didn't play hockey, I would lose my mind. Mm-hmm. So I still play, like, probably once or twice a week on average when I'm not suspended <laughs> for being a bad boy. Um, but, yeah. I think I think but that, saying that was your childhood, the, right? That was definitely my childhood. That uh, I did I did some acting, mm-hmm. you know. Um, well, we'll get to your IMDb credits. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but and I always loved that. Obviously, I was kind of a class clown, but yeah, to suggest that I had any more aspirations in hockey would be uh, wouldn't be genuine. <laughs> Do you have any like glory day moments from those hockey games? Do you remember a particular I, standout performance? Uh, there were a few here to be, to be honest with you. Um, when one you of my get favorite... drunk and start telling your hockey stories, what huh? comes out? Say it again. I'm saying when you get drunk and tell your hockey stories, right? What comes my, out? my, uh, Hey, let me tell you kid. What I did. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there's a few that, that kind of stood out to me that were kind of cool. Like there was one particular game that, so I was playing in upstate New York and we had a game that was closer to the metro area. And my grandma was still alive, and she hadn't seen me play in a long, long time. And I was just, it was like the first game of the year, and I was so geared up to play. It was my junior year of college, um, and first game of the season. And we were playing one of the better teams, mm-hmm. and we were not. And I scored five <laughs> goals in the game. Like, Damn. We won 7-5. Is, is there a name for five? Yeah. No, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, I scored, five, <laughs> I scored two in the first, two in the second, and then I, I scored the empty netter to clinch it. Uh, <laughs> and we won the game 7-5. And it was just really an amazing moment because, like, my whole family was there, mm-hmm. you know. Like, my grandma was there and my aunts were there, and they just never got to saw me, see me play. My dad even came. He didn't get to really see me play much, which was pretty cool. And I remember at the end of the game, my best friend was playing goalie, and I shot I – they were just putting on all sorts of pressure. We were up 6-5 with, like, you know, whatever it was, a minute left, 45 seconds left. And we had a face-off in our zone, and I won the face-off, and then I, I shot it down the whole way and scored in the empty net. And my, my best friend, Brad Topper, who was the goalie at the time – he and I just a huge embrace as if we were like, it was so stupid as if we like this won game, anything more game than just one of the season. game one. But <laughs> we were, we were pretty bad the year before. Mm-hmm. So to win the first game and in that fashion, it was kind of cool. So it was just uh, one of many hockey memories that kind of stand out. And what about hockey injuries? I have terrible shoulders. I have separated or dislocated both of my shoulders mm. numerous, numerous times. Yeah. Um, first one happening my junior year of high school. Uh, one of my most disappointing things was my senior year of high school where I was like, I'm going to be the man. This is my year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was trying out for a junior team and got injured in – I was trying out for a different team and I, was tr- and, and I fell awkwardly, separated my right shoulder and couldn't play. And then by the time like my shoulder had gotten back into it, I had to kind of join a different team. And it was just like it was my senior year. I was looking yeah. forward to it. So it just kind of sucked. But my shoulders both have been – uh, you know, yeah, pretty. Bad. That sounds like a real manly injury. I mean, I once sneezed in the shower and threw my back out. So I do that now. I'm, yeah, I mean, that happens. All, I mean, right now my neck is sore. I don't know what from. Yeah, you just know, being so. in a different bed last night, probably. Yeah, no, this just it's happens all, all the time now. That pillow's a little thicker, <laughs> right? I, unfortunately, my shoulders are pretty good now. Knock on wood. I'm gonna hear. You guys gonna hear this? I'm knocking on wood. Um, but I, I still do like shoulder exercise to kind of keep them. Mm-hmm. So when you were at SUNY Albany, you studied journalism and biology. Yeah. That, the plan with that was to become... I have no idea. I think college is kind of stupid um, for many people. Player. I think college is really cool for some people. Uh, case in point. Okay, so my nephew, who is just this like ridiculously motivated... I, I, I'm so proud of who he is. He, he went to Annapolis, uh, and he is now flying fighter jets. Yeah. Uh, he's up in Whippy Island. Uh, he's in the Navy... You know, and he just knew, he knew at like 13, 14 years old, this is what I want to do. But I think for the most of us, I don't know about you, but for most of us at like 14, 15 years old, we have no idea. Can I curse? Yeah. Okay. We have no idea what the fuck we want to do with life, you know, and what we want to do in like the world. And I went to college 
at like 17 years old or whatever it was. And I was like, I haven't, because that's what we did. Where I grew up, it was like everybody went to college. Yeah, it same wasn't here. A, yeah, it wasn't a matter of like, oh, are you going to college? It was, oh, where are you going? Exactly. That was the thing. Um, you go, you spend a couple years drinking, and you'll figure it out. Yeah, and I just don't understand that. Like, So I went to college, and I was like, I don't know what I want. And they were like, well, just take courses and things that you enjoy. So I was like, okay. So I started, I, I actually wrote for the, I wrote a sports column for, uh, when I was at Hamilton, I wrote a sports column and then at, at Albany as well. I was writing like a sports column for yeah. them. Uh, funny enough, my mom kept them. I just, I literally just <laughs> got it from her. She like brought it out when she came out to visit us for, uh, for Christmas. And, um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> but so I, I like that and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And mm. I like biology. I like science growing up. So I was like, I'll do that. I had no idea what I wanted. Which like brings me to my point, which is, um, I think college is great for some people. I think college is great at some point. Um, if I could do it over again, I probably would have taken like two or three years off, figured out some stuff, and then I would have gone back to school knowing at least like, oh, this is what I want to go to school yeah. for. You've been more dedicated, know exactly. Oh, hundred percent. I remember when I moved to around. LA. When I moved to LA after I graduated, I spent one year in Manhattan. And then I, uh, I moved to L.A. and I took like – I just took classes at a, uh, Santa Monica Community College just for yeah. fun. I was like, I like studying. I like going to school. I know mm -hmm. I'm weird. Um, I took those courses. They cost me $36 for a class. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> it was uh, $12 a credit, I guess. So it was three credits. So $36 for a class for a full semester. And I would take like one class a semester in all sorts of different things. I took those classes far more serious – than I did when I was actually like in college getting my exactly. degree. And I just realized, I was like, no, I'm older and I know what I want to do, you know? What and if I mean, you had I, done this first? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, why didn't I just go get a job? Mm -hmm. You know, try, I don't know, whatever you want to do, figure it out and then go back to college. And I guess the argument is, well, maybe you won't go back then. Okay, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, you go to LA. I went to LA. With dreams of stardom. I don't know. Um, I dated a girl. So I met this girl, uh, Donna. In I'm trying to come up with new stuff that nobody's ever asked me but that I'd never like revealed. So I dated this girl. I met this girl <laughs> the summer after my sophomore well, year. We of could college. promote your podcast where you can get all these stories. And no, no, more. but I haven't actually told these kind of like little things. Okay, so cool. anyway, like it's boring stuff, but it's kind of cool. Anyway, yeah. So sophomore year after college, I was hanging out with one of my best friends. He was dating a girl, and a girl came to visit her. They were like childhood mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this girl Donna ended up like hanging out. We ended up like hanging out for two weeks. Had a great time, and then like. She came to visit me, and I went to visit her, and then she came to visit me, and I went to visit her, and like back and forth and back and forth, and she lived in L.A., and we kind of had this like long-distance relationship for like three years. It was pseudo-exclusive, but not – like it was like exclusive, but it was like when we went on – like when I went to spring break, she was like – Have fun. Go have fun. Yeah. And same for her. It was like, okay. It was kind of a weird, mature, like long-distance open relationship, mm -hmm. but we really like loved each other, and I still to this day love her. You know, mm -hmm. I'm still friends with her brother. Uh, she lives in Chicago now. She's married with a kid. She's a great, great person. Um, nothing but love for her. But anyway, uh, part of it was like to get a change. I was doing a little bit of acting and, you know, I was in L.A. I was in New York and I didn't really know what exactly I wanted. And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to go out to L.A. for three or four months, see if I can get a job. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I could like stay with her parents. She still was in school for one more year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I know I can, I, can stay, uh, I can stay with the parents for like a few weeks to kind of get my feet on the ground. I did. And then, you know, got a job, got a different job. You know, I interviewed for some, like I actually got a job with like an investment banking firm. It was mm. weird. Yeah, you've uh, had a lot of acting. jobs. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm a big believer a in like... You're a bartender. You did physical therapy. I'm a big believer in life experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, like to me... I feel like you're never too old to kind of reinvent yourself. If you're not happy doing what you're doing, then do something else. Yeah. You know, you only get one chance at this. Of course. If you're not happy doing your, whatever it is you're doing, change. Stop wasting time. <laughs> yeah. What, like, what, what are you doing? Um, so, but yeah, so I've, I tried a, a bunch of things, you know, investment banking. I, I was, I've always kind of been like, a, like I've always loved investing in like finance and that kind of mm -hmm. world. Like my dad was an accountant. So, yeah. but after like a month of that, I was like, oh, this kind of sucks. <laughs> I was like, I like doing the analyst part, but I was like, they just had me like cold calling a bunch of people and like asking them. I was like, this is stupid. Uh, let's talk about your acting career. Acting career. Yeah. Career is <laughs> a, a very, 
It's a very generous. You word. have some credits here. I mean, I, I mean, it may look like extra work, I guess. No, it wasn't extra work. Yeah, but none like... of my credits are, are. None of that is extra work that you see. <laughs> I swear, I did extra work. In fact, my first extra job was oh man, it was a Pamela Anderson movie. Um, Barbed wire. Yes, you got it. My my uh, my father took me to that. Way too young. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. was a very inappropriate so, movie to go to see when you're I'm, that I'm age. like in LA like for a hot minute mm-hmm. and somebody told me like, oh, if you want to like learn what a set, it, like, like somebody had told me that you should learn what, um, you know, what it's like when they're filming. Yeah. You know, what's going on. And I was like, that makes sense, <laughs> you know? So I, you basically fill out an application at this place called Central Casting. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that still exists or not. I assume it does. But central casting was basically like you register to be an extra. And when they need bodies. They had, right. And they had union extras and non union extras. Okay. So they had union extras and non union extras. And the way, uh, the, way the, 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 the contracts were still like that, each of these shows had to actually. They had to hire a certain amount of union extras at a certain price, which was higher, before they could go with non-union. Got it. And the big goal for every extractor was like, become union. Because if you became union, you got like health benefits. Yeah. And Just SAG, to stand there. <laughs> oh, SAG health benefits were amazing. Plus, yeah. you got paid like double. You got a lot of – it was much better. Anyway, so this is my first gig, and I got – I applied, and they needed an extra, and I – was one of the non-union extras on this show mm-hmm. on Barbed Wire. Yeah. So what, do you remember what you did on the, in the I movie? I walked on an airplane. Oh, okay. So I guess there's an airplane. So it wasn't never, like the night I've never seen scenes. the movie, by the way. <laughs> okay. You're not missing much. I've never seen the movie. I was wearing a leather jacket. I remember mm-hmm. my leather there's jacket. There's a lot of leather in that movie. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, I was only wearing a leather jacket, by the way. Nothing else. Just uh, a shirtless? Just shirtless, exactly. No pants. <laughs> <laughs> my bare, my bare, like, 22-year-old ass. There you go. Um, anyway, um, so... I remember doing that. I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. And I looked at it and I got, I saw Pamela Anderson. And she obviously was like far away from me. And, yeah. You know, but you know, you could see the director and I saw the cameras and I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, and then I went out and I did a couple of student films and I got an agent and I got a manager and I started doing, doing some thing. other things. Uh, I, Any yeah. auditions that you came close on that ended uh, up being I, a I mean, a there thing? was one that was kind of funny. So... There was uh, the casting director that cast all of the like the kid shows, um, like Saved by the Bell, mm-hmm. that kind of whole venue of shows. Yeah, there was a bunch of those that came out. Obviously, anyway, there was a show that came out called I think it was City Kids. Okay, I'm I'm, I'm blanking on the exact name, but I think it was called City Kids. Anyway, I went in for like four or five uh, auditions for that. Call back, call back, call back, and I got screen test for that. Mm-hmm. And it was basically a hundred percent because you could see who was there. So at the screen test, it's kind of cool. They bring you into the, you're actually in at the studio. Yeah. And it's not just the casting director, the directors, the writers, the producer. It's like the, now it's the network heads there. Cause they're like, okay, who are we going to like sign off the next three to five years to do this project? So you could see like, and I had the scripts, so you could see, oh, the teacher, you could see three guys that were going to like, they were all up for the one role. Yeah. You know? And the girl, the brunette one, there was two of them. And there were three of the blonde girl. And there were two guys for my role. That was it. No, um, man. Actually, no, there was a third guy, but they stopped bringing... So they brought each of us in once, and then the third guy never went in again. <laughs> like, it wasn't like, oh, let's be friendly. And it just this kept is, going... This uh, is get your hopes up time. Well, it just kept going back. It was basically uh, this blonde guy who had, like, long hair. He would go in, then he'd come out, then I would go in, then, and we'd keep doing the scenes. And we did the same scenes with each and every person. Yeah, chemistry so test. It was like a hundred, like absolutely, there was no doubt between me and him. I talked to my manager after the fact, and they were like, there are a couple people in there that absolutely loved you. It's between you guys. And I found out a couple of days later that it was him. I don't know if that would have done anything. Yeah. Like I said, it was like a Saved by the Bell type show, <laughs> City Kids. I think it went for like three or four years, mm-hmm. but it was like the lead on that show. It's like um, a Saturday morning kind of thing? Hmm? Like a Saturday morning kind of show? Yeah, exactly. Like okay. that that exact venue. Um, the other thing that I did was that could have theoretically launched my career in a different path was I actually did book uh, a pilot for Fox. Okay. And filmed it. And it was with Paula Marshall and Dan Cortez. Do you remember Dan Cortez? Yeah, from, from MTV. Yeah, exactly. And Paula Marshall and um, Bob Guten, the guy, the warden from Shawshank. The one who blows his head off at the end? Yeah. 
Spoilers. Sorry. For one of the greatest if anybody hasn't seen Shawshank, time. right? <laughs> Somebody at home was like, no, I'm yeah. watching Shawshank. This is terrible. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so I got the pilot. And um, they changed the name of it. I'm trying to... Uh, you wouldn't hear about it, obviously, because it was a pilot and never got picked up. Yeah. But it was... Uh, it was like, I mean, it's a professional pilot that got like, you know, I had to go in, same thing, tested for it, another thing, all this stuff. And I got the part. Anyway, uh, the warden played Paula Marshall's dad. Okay. And Dan Cortez was her love interest. Okay. And I was one of the reoccurring role. I was one of the guys. Uh, it was actually funny. It was a hockey thing. Oh, cool. So and Dan the- Cortez was like a former goalie. That's awesome. And he was going to, uh, and I was one of the players, and he was my coach, and there's a bunch. Anyway, so I was going to be back and forth, and, you know, we'd, we'd have parties at, like, the writer and the creator's house, and he'd bring us all there, and he'd be like, oh, talk. He's like, episode three is when I get you, you got a, you got a girl. And I'm like, yes, this is awesome. <laughs> like, it was really exciting. Um, you know, I had a contract for, like, the full season. Cause yeah. Cause when you have, sign they off. They have to own you so you don't do anything else. Well, basically, they just want to make sure that. You know, if if the show gets big, at least mm-hmm. they have you at a at a reasonable cost for a while. I guess exactly. that is. Exactly. So it's a rookie you know, you, contract. Right. You sign this whole thing where basically you do the pilot, and if it gets picked up, this is how much money mm-hmm. you will make. And at this point in my life, I'm looking at the contract like, "Holy shit! Are you fucking kidding me?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, we're talking like five figures per episode. Mm-hmm. I'm like, my mouth was like, "Are you?" And that's what they're starting with. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and I'm like, I'm a nobody. And who knows? It could become the next Friends, and you'll be uh Yeah, I mean, it was, like I said, it was, an episode a, and... it, was, it was a Fox show. Yeah. And I'm just like, you know, you think to yourself going, okay, well, if this show took off, what happened? In fact, I actually missed my best friend's wedding for it. The and I'm, I am all like about Friends. a screening friends. of the movie? No, no, this, yeah, the screening. <laughs> I was like, hey, dude, I'm busy. Star Wars is up. Uh, no, my best friend's wedding. Okay, so my best friend is uh, this guy, Keith Barrett, who I love to death. Uh, he actually comes to the World Series every summer to play mm-hmm. one event. Uh, it was a great. It was actually a great story. He and his dad came out uh, a few years ago. Yeah, and they both played and they both cashed. Oh, that's great. It was a really cool story. <laughs> uh, Jane Furman took pictures of him mm-hmm. and everything. It was really cool. His dad passed away. Uh, just a great guy. He like grew up in that house. But he got married, and I would. I was the best man. It's actually me, oh, that's me and Brad. Well, me and Brad. It was the three of us. Me, mm-hmm. Brad, and Keith. Brad was the goalie, and Keith didn't play hockey. Anyway. He, we were both the best man, and I would never in a million years, I wouldn't miss the wedding for anything. Of course. Except I literally was filming. No, he's got to understand this. And he did. He understood. Great. He, I, understood, he, we're, I was filming a pilot, which mm-hmm. could change my life. I mean, this is what I've been, like, going for. You know, mm-hmm. I've been, I've, I had a bunch of, like, you know, three lines, five lines, seven lines. I've been auditioning. I did a commercial. You know, I was, I was sag and everything, and I'm like, okay, you're trying to make ends meet. And this is, I have a part in a show, and if it gets picked up, I'm going to be a regular on a show on Fox, right? This is, this is it. This was actually an episode of Friends, by the way, where Joey has to rush to the wedding in costume. Right. <laughs> Except the difference was, yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't make the wedding, though, because his, uh, you know, his wedding was back east. Uh, I did send him a video mm-hmm. that um, was in very poor taste, but it was, it was very, uh, a guy-on-guy thing. It was just, yeah. uh, Hopefully they didn't show it at the church. No, he did. He didn't show up the church, but he did show it. He, he he was like, "Let me put this in," and his wife was like, "Oh, Tuckman sent you a, a best man speech. Let me watch." Oh yeah. And he was like, "Oh my god. Oh, oh let me turn that off." <laughs> Hopefully, um, to get him too much trouble. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about what is on your IMDb page. Okay, go ahead. So those have, are those uh, are things that yeah, that, those are things that didn't happen. Another thing that was actually cool was that might not be there. Also, is the perfect storm. The movie, the perfect storm. I was in the movie, the perfect storm. Well, oh, sorry. Okay. I filmed Russell for Crow. a week. I played a, a uh, one of the, they have an Air Force base. Mm-hmm. There's a whole Coast Guard scene. Anyway, they cut, they filmed for a week up at Point Magoo. They cut the entire thing because the film was too long, I guess. <laughs> it was And long. it was really, really upsetting because. In fact, I think I'm confusing it with Master and Commander, Far Side of the World right now. I haven't seen it. They're all the same. I have no idea. But anyway, <laughs> I was really excited because I'm like George Clooney, you know, Wahlberg. I'm like, you know, Wolfgang yeah, now Peterson. Now I know I'm confusing it. This is Wolfgang Peterson's director. I'm like, I can't believe I got this part. This yeah. is amazing. And I'm like, I know it's a small role, but I'm like, I'm going to be in the movie for, say, 40 seconds. You had lines. Oh, I had lines. I was, yeah. like, I was in. I was, we filmed for like four or five days up at Point Magoo. And I'm like, this is a movie that for the first time in my life, my dad and my mom and all her friends are going to go to the movies and be like, there's David. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe it. Did they at least and, tell you beforehand? Okay, so they didn't tell me beforehand, but I kind of knew it was 
they had like a screening and then they had another thing and they called me up to like make sure I got the correct spelling of my name and I gave him that and then I didn't get I didn't hear back from him again Mm. for a while (laughs) and then I saw the screening and I was like hmm and the girl I was dating at the time was like well maybe you're still in it I'm like no Uh, you see the guy who's dying right now (laughs) yeah my scene was with him so that's not good Uh, so I got cut out of that so anyway, yeah, unless they do a weird some close, flashback, some clo- yeah. So I, I felt like I had some close calls. Uh, yeah, well, you were on me. Beverly Hills nine hundred two and L. There's some bragging rights. That was my first like played, legit like job, I guess. Like I did a commercial before that. I had a couple of small I things. Can't but tell if they gave you a name or if they just called you guy. <laughs> I was just guy. I had role. I had lines though, so mm-hmm. um, that was sort of cool. I we filmed it in Sherman Oaks and at a movie theater. And the part basically was uh, Jason Priestley, I guess, was going through some stuff. He in the having, show. He was, yeah, in, in the show. <laughs> probably in real life, too. Yeah. Uh, super nice guy, though, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> he was going, his character was going through some stuff on the show. Anyway, I guess he was dating Jenny Garth's character at the time. They're at the movie theater. And we're walking down. It's like the end of the movie. So we're all walking down the stairs. And Jenny Garth stops. I don't see her, and I walk into her, and I knock her over. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Total gentleman like me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, bend, I get down to help her up. Jason Priestley loses his shit. He comes over. He's like, get your hands off her, man. Oh, total and he overreaction. Grabs, oh, total overreaction. Like I said, he was going through some tough times in his life. Mm-hmm. Total overreaction. Grabs me. I grab him. I'm like, what's your problem, man? Now, the good news is, like, Jason Priestley is, like, five foot seven. <laughs> I looked huge. Like, yeah. he's five foot seven, like, maybe 135. I'm not a big guy, but I'm, like, 5'11", 170. You're a former hockey player. That's all that matters. Okay, 5'11", 170, next to 5'7", 135, looks like a monster. <laughs> yeah. Especially with the cameras. Um, and like, perspective. Yeah, all of his friends were like, dude, what are you doing to him? Because mm-hmm. clearly I hadn't done anything. That was it. Yeah. That was my first role. Brandon, Kelly, hey, hey. Oh! oh! Right now, you're Brandon. my problem. Yes. Forget yes. about it, whatever it was. Forget about Brandon. it. Brandon, hey, what is the matter with you? That's cool, though. It was you, awesome. You got to be the alpha in your role. Yeah, and it was, and it was fun. Obviously, I'm like a 90210. It's one of like exactly. the iconic shows. Well, I mean, the I one was, that I was jealous about was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I mean, I was, I was obsessed with that show growing up. Yeah, Buffy was cool. Um, that was probably the moment of my career where I thought I was going to make it. Oh, okay. Like, there was one moment in your career where you think... So, okay. I was in the middle of... I had already done the test for the network, and I didn't get that part. Mm-hmm. But I was like, okay. But I was in the middle of, like, my fourth callback for the pilot for Fox. Yeah. I was in a transportation car. I was in a car. They were driving me to, the, to Point Magoo for... <laughs> Perfect Storm. Perfect Storm. When I got the phone call telling me I got the part for Buffy. Now you got three things? Come yeah, and, on. And, and for anybody out there who's ever tried acting or anybody <laughs> out there who's like knows, I mean, if you get an audition, you're like, yeah, I got an audition. Yeah, even and having was, a sniff of one thing is a good yeah, thing. Yeah, and I just felt like it was the first time, in my, it was the first and probably only time in my acting career where I was like, I felt like a baller. Like I was like, you had some heat. Like, uh, hold on a second, man. I was like, yeah. Uh, so what's the rate? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, yeah. Okay. I That's guess fine. I I'll can take that slum too. a Buffy episode. <laughs> So we did the Buffy uh, episode. I actually had to film it twice. Okay. Which was fun because I got paid twice. Okay. Do you die in it or anything? Or No, I was a nerd in it, actually. So <laughs> there was a huge... I'm like doing homework in my room. <laughs> and there's a huge I looked fight. up the episode. It's like uh, Buffy's roommate goes crazy. and Yeah. Anyway, there's... <laughs> Yeah, so Buffy's roommates, I guess a demon or whatever, goes crazy. <laughs> Buffy and the demon are fighting, and they're flying against the walls. Like, psh, bam, psh, blam, pam, you know. Mm-hmm. Insert any Batman-type poo yeah. you want to do. And I'm finally, I'm like, ah. Oh. And I... These girls won't let me study. Right, and I <laughs> lean out my door like a nerd, and I'm like, will you keep it down down there? <laughs> People are trying to study. (laughs) 
<laughs> so we had to reshoot it twice, so it was kind of cool. So That's I got paid fun. twice, but I still get residuals from that. I actually just got a check. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't tell you. If, I don't know if it was from that or not. No, but I still get checks for these things. I just got a check for sixteen cents. Sixteen cents. Yeah, so my financial woes are over. Wow. Well, we, we are can't, set. We can't go through all your credits, but you also had Party of Five on there and Saved by the Bell, the new class, which is kind of fun. You get to work with Dustin Diamond. <laughs> that was the guy that was uh, the casting director. That <laughs> she and I just hit it off. She loved. She always thought she was like, "You're good. You're great." You're yeah. Amazing. So she got me that. The only cool thing about Party Five, I'll tell you really quick, was a uh, quick story about Jennifer Love Hewitt. Um, she, I'm on the Party Five set, right? And one of the guys there played hockey, so we were like talking about that and everything. And then during lunch, you know, we go to the like the area where everybody eats, next mm -hmm. to the canteen or whatever. And I'm going there, and obviously I don't really know anybody on the. I think it was the Sony lot we filmed, okay. and I know nobody there, and everybody knows somebody, obviously. And Love, she liked to be called Love at this point, at this point. Mm -hmm. she came over and she goes, hey, do you know anybody here? Do you want to have lunch? And I was like, uh, uh yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, of course. Yeah. So I ate lunch with her. And I was like, that's so cool. I, I later saw her like a couple of years after because apparently she used the same veterinarian as I used. Oh. And she remembered me. So I'm pretty sure she had a crush on me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like 90%. Was, I'm 90% sure that I dropped daily the, or? I think I dropped the ball on that one. <laughs> I think I had a chance with her. That's funny. <laughs> no, I'm okay. Yeah. Well, you never know. You never know. You never, you never know. know. Either way, though, she was ridiculously nice. Like I said, I mean, I went there. I knew nobody. And she sat down with me. and was like, hey, do you want to have lunch? And I was like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, acting didn't work out. Yeah. Um, well, I kind of stopped. I don't know if it didn't work out. I mean, I feel like it did. Or you just... Stop I kind of started writing. Yeah, yeah, I started writing and stuff like that. And you were gambling at this point, right? I was playing poker. Um, I was doing a lot of writing. A buddy of mine that actually lives in Vegas right now, we were writing and we did some writing and we we did a, found a little bit of success here and there with it. Um, I did a cool like educational theater program thing where I played this like jock. We did a show called uh, Nightmare on Puberty Street. Okay. Where I would wake up every morning. We would. It's for Kaiser Permanente. It was their educational program. It was their their way to give back to the community. We'd go to the office, wake up at 4.30 in the morning, go to the office, pick up the van, and drive to a school in Southern California, <laughs> and then put on the show. We've all been to school. You've all had that, that experience, right, where you've been to the assembly and somebody's – well, anyway, our show was – they had an award-winning show that was for older kids that was about, it was about AIDS. They had a younger one, and then I did the middle one, which was geared toward, like, 6th to 8th graders, and it's called Nightmare on Puberty Street. And it dealt with, like, drug use and, like, pressuring people to have – Sex, peer pressure, and that kind of stuff. Wow! And it was kind of cool. Flashback to my high school years. I yeah. also did theater and did a similar thing. Like, okay. We had to travel to middle schools and stuff like that. It was honestly, it was one of the most. Premarital sex is evil, and here's yeah. a skit no, why. No, see, ours was pretty cool. <laughs> like, pretty we didn't go down that route at all. Yeah. Like it was really, we were just like you know, be smart and listen to people, and I don't know. It was. I will say that it was probably one of the most. I didn't make a, a lot of money doing it, mm -hmm. you know, but. It was so rewarding. I mean, I had kids coming to me. Like, we're doing shows in, like, downtown L.A. and, like, some really rough areas. And I would have, like, 13-year-old kids come to us because they, they thought we were, like, 18 probably. Yeah. And, you know, we've got hats on backwards. We're, like, all, you know, geared up. And they'd be, like, I don't know what to do. Like, I had one girl come to me, like, tell me, uh, I don't know what to do. I'm pregnant and I've already had an abortion. My dad's going to kill me. She's, like, 13. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of stuff we'd have to, like, you know, it was... Oof. Yeah, it was pretty heavy, <laughs> that's but it heavy was cool. Stuff, yeah. It was really rewarding. I did that for a year, and that was pretty amazing. Yeah, you've, that's a, that's a, another gig in a list of gigs that you... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's what I was saying. Like, so I, don't, I don't think acting didn't work out, because, like, I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, 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 I feel like I kind of voluntarily was like, okay, let me try something else. Yeah. I remember working an event, uh, a poker tournament I had to cover, and trying to steal a, a, a football stream. Um, and being surprised to see your face on Sky Sports. Oh man! <laughs> yeah. When I was watching this like illegal stream of the, an NFL game one. Yeah. Okay. One yeah, you Sunday. hijacked a, a stream from e Sky Sports. Exactly. But that's how I was like, oh, there's Tuckman. You know, he's doing the football thing. Uh, yeah, was well, there was a time when you maybe thought football or was the way you're gonna go before poker or after poker. Or... Uh, I think it's funny. Like if you talk to like Ali, myself, Stapes, it's like. I think there was, there was a moment where all of us were like, okay, let's try to get out of poker. We're going to try to get out. <laughs> and then just keep crawling us back, for like pulling us back in. Yeah, Ali um, was on this show talking about his close calls with MTV. <laughs> right, like you're like, ah, and it just poker keeps calling. Um, 
so I was doing live at the bike and then when live at the bike live I did a show because of live at the bike I got a show through like the poker channel in Europe mm -hmm. and that got me a lot of connections in Europe and in London and I met a guy and I was like oh I really would love to do this and I met a guy who kind of like introduced me to the producer of Sky Sports and they were looking for an American analyst oh really uh, okay and I was like hey I'm you know, I'm thinking about moving to London, and he's like, okay. So we started working through it, and, you know, long story shortish, I, uh, you know, I got this offer to, to go. I was dating this girl that was British at the time, and I think we were both kind of racing. Like, if she had found a job in L.A., mm. she would have moved to L.A., and we would have stayed there. And if I got a job in London, we would have, I would have moved there, and I got the job first. Yeah. So I did that, and then, randomly enough, uh, I gave him a call. I sent him an email after the... New York Giants beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Was this the, the first time? Okay, the miraculous helmet catch. Yes, <laughs> and I sent them an email, and I was like, "Wow, oh my God, I can't." And I was I was slated to start the following September, and I was just like, "What a game!" And I was headed to Utah to go snowboarding and skiing. And I was like, "What a game! This is amazing!" Uh, you know, can't wait to work with you next year. You know, and I uh, he calls me up like twenty minutes later. Tuck, what do you know about motorsports? <laughs> and he hired me and then it, right then and there he hired me to cover NASCAR and what did you know about motorsports uh, not, a lot. <laughs> not a lot but I learned I'm a really quick learner yeah there you go really really quick learn and uh, you know obviously poker called you back in 2011 you've been with the World Series of Poker ever since yeah I mean I never really left poker to be honest when I moved out there I was still doing um, I started doing like the highlight shows for poker stars like W mm -hmm. Coops yeah and Scoops and stuff like that so I was doing those um, I was doing the random EPTs. Like, mm -hmm. I remember I actually met Kara Scott in, uh, where was it? I forget where it was. Anyway, Dortmund, maybe? I don't know exactly. But anyway, I met her on an EPT. Mm -hmm. I worked with James Hardigan. And I met Kara that night. And I was like, oh, my God. And we became, obviously, we're good friends now. Um, so I was still doing, like, the occasional EPTs and stuff mm -hmm. like that and little things. So I still was do. I was... Like, while I was doing the... Fortunately, I mean, NASCAR and NFL was only, like, once or twice a week. Yeah. So I still had plenty of time to do poker also. And I was still playing a ton of poker. And now that I lived over there, I was playing online also. Mm -hmm. So... But in 2009, I actually worked the World Series of Poker Europe with Maury and Poker Productions. I was just a producer on the floor. And then the following year, they had me do the live stream for the World Series of Poker Europe mm -hmm. at Empire Casino. And I think I did that two years. And then in 2011, they were when, like, ESPN wants us. That's when, yeah, that's when it kind <laughs> of like, that was like, wow, this is awesome. And then it was gone. <laughs> Immediately. They're like, right. yeah, maybe we committed too much. <laughs> right, right. This is amazing. <laughs> we're yeah. going to dip our toe into poker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we got some rapid fire questions to close it out. If Let's you're do it. Rapid fire. Uh, we might have to adapt these because some of these are for players. Biggest pot you've ever witnessed? I can say big, the, the biggest pot I've ever, I've, I've ever witnessed or played. Biggest pot I've ever, ever witnessed is like $1.2 million. Mm -hmm. like I this is one of it. the things you Tom called. Tom Dwan, yeah. Phil Ivey. Yeah. Uh, it was like $1.2, $1.1 million, something ridiculous like that. The biggest pot I've ever been involved with is about 18000 Yeah. And how was the, uh, the hairs on the back of the neck on that one? Um, it was okay. I mean, honestly, like I had... You don't sweat the big I ones? I turned the nuts. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's nice. I turned the nuts and uh, against two players. We were all in, and then the river paired, and I lost. Um, oh, okay. So it didn't end up well, but I was like, by the time I lost, it was more like, <gasps> like super excited <laughs> to, um, oh, are you kidding? No. Mm. As you watch an $18,000 pot go to somewhere else. And somewhere. how do you shake off that feeling? Do you take a walk? Do you take a week long break? Do I don't. If for me, a lot of times I'll a lot of times I'll take a break if I'm running bad, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm playing bad, if things are going bad. In a situation like that, yeah, I think you, I think I I, I don't remember exactly what I did. My guess would be that I probably got up and left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you deal with the haters? Is a two plus two thread that popped up that said, "I can't stand David Tuckman." Oh, uh, is there a new one? No, it's an old one. Oh, okay. I was gonna say because <laughs> there used to be a ton. Um, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of proof that I, in my line of work, I'm never going to make everybody happy. Mm. Um, you know, there are going to be people out there that appreciate my hard work and, you know, my attention to detail. And there are people out there that will like my sense of humor and there are people out there that are hated. And that's fine, you know. I mean, what's great about poker these days and really broadcast is like 
first of all, you can mute it. <laughs> Second of all, there's different people. For, like, I mean, some people are going right. to love Stapes. People and like some different people probably music. hate him, you know, and then mm-hmm. some people really want like analytics and they, you know, you, and you're going to like somebody different than that, you know? And I feel like there's somebody for everybody. So, I mean, I think earlier on in my career, it was probably tough. Um, but at this point, I'm just like, okay, man, you know, I'll try to just kill him with kindness. I'll be like, I'm sorry that I'm not fulfilling your, your, <laughs> your standards, you know, man, the I'm first, doing my uh, best. I'm, I'm trying the first couple comments on this podcast when I was like, I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just like making it up as I went the first right. few episodes. And I was like, whoa, these are brutal. <laughs> I better stop reading these. Yeah. And if you honestly, <laughs> if you can't deal with it, if you're like, you know, whether you're an actor, a poker player, a podcaster, if you're in any business where you're, you're in the limelight, I think if you can't deal with criticism, it's mm-hmm. really, really tough. Yeah. Because it's just, it's going to come. It's going to happen. It's got to roll off. Yeah, I'm from New York, so I'm like, whatever. I always tell people, I'm like, I don't take things personal. I'm like, if you want to come at me, that's cool. Just be funny. Yeah. You know, don't just say something stupid like, oh, I hope you die in a grease fire. <laughs> like, be more original. If you're funny and you come at me with something really, really good when you troll me, I'll read it. <laughs> so. He'll read it and retweet it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> you know? Do you remember your longest final table broadcast? Was there any particular brutal one that just wouldn't? I don't end? remember. I don't remember one in particular, to be honest. I know I've had I've had final tables that have been like fourteen, fifteen hours. Mm-hmm. Usually, it's funny though. Sometimes the ones that are more brutal than others are the ones that are like that get heads up really quick. Yes, and then they take too long to finish. Yeah, them. and it's just like two players that aren't, and it's not their fault. I feel yeah, bad for them. They're just but deep. it's two players that aren't accustomed to playing heads up. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of like limp, check, check, check. Check, check. Up, oh, you got king high, you win. Yeah. And like, they don't have to be deep, but it's like, if, especially if you're playing in a, in a tournament series where, the, where the, uh, the levels don't decrease when they get heads up. So you're playing like hour long. Yeah. And it's oh, like, God. these guys are like 70 big blinds deep and they're going like, you know, two big blinds are exchanging hands back and forth. It's I know as a, as and a I know poker it's reporter, for the as a poker reporter, I get to this mode where, you know, the first eight hours of the day, I'm fine. That last four hours... I'm rooting for the big stack every single of time. Of course we are. It's I, hard not to do it in the broadcast booth as yeah. well. You're, You're like, like, yeah, let's go. Come on, short stack. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, you know, you try to just keep it fun. and You try to remember that, like, you know, for the players, this is their day. Mm-hmm. They may never get there again. Mm-hmm. So try to make it special for them. You know, for people that are watching at home, a lot of time, it's like it's relatives, it's friends, it's our kids, grandparents, whatever it might be. And you want to make it special for them as well. Yeah, and they're going to take any criticism you say so personally. Right, so, and, that's, and that's not our job. We try to keep – I mean the whole thing of this is just to keep it entertaining, as entertaining as we possibly can. So uh, – but yeah, there. I'm not going to lie. There are some that are just – they get internally long. You're just like, oh, no more. Who was the worst uh, pro player you had in the booth? <laughs> the worst pro player? Yeah. Who was the worst person you had in the booth or anybody who was not invited back for uh, just not cutting it? I'm trying to think. Anybody dropped too many f bombs? <laughs> oh, there's plenty of people that have dropped too many. F- there have been plenty of people that have been like 86 by the companies I've worked for, <laughs> like Ray D, for example. Oh yeah, I thought he was brilliant. I love Ray D. I thought he was. I mean, hysterical. I was laughing my ass off. But <laughs> I don't think he's welcome back in because of you know where he goes. You know, um, you know. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, there probably is. And if I, if I thought about it really long and hard i could probably come up with a name or two but i don't think there's a reason to be mean you never got those like uh situations where you're like trying to wrangle somebody in who's going too far off the deep end and you're just like oh, oh I, yeah I, hey I we're recording this in all fairness that's actually i i think that's probably one of my strengths i'm really good mm-hmm. at kind of adapting to people that are with me so you know if somebody's really really good at telling stories or somebody's really funny like our our uh, reigning player of the year is hysterical. I yeah. had no idea. So he can't. He joined me in the booth this past summer, and I was like, "You're funny." I was like, "Okay, just go." <laughs> and then there are sometimes where somebody's just not that good at it or not that comfortable with it, and you know, I'll I'll send a little private message to our producer and be like, "Hey, this person should be out in 30 minutes." Yeah, and that's okay. I mean, but I don't want to be maybe mean. a Kinda commercial like, break is needed, <laughs> huh? <laughs> maybe we go to a commercial quicker than usual, right? Or whatever. Yeah. Uh, all right. Okay, I'll, these are rapid fire. I'm sorry, rapid, I'm terrible. It's all rapid good. Fire it's all ones. good. What was your worst job before poker? The job you hate, you've had a lot of gig, gigs, so what's one you would I mean, never uh, do again? Retail. Yeah? I hate folding clothes. I mean, in fact, 
the deal I made with my wife when we got together, which mm-hmm. we moved in together, was, okay, I'll do garbage, you do laundry. Yeah. I hate folding clothes. I will literally do laundry and then just leave it in the laundry thing and then just take the clothes out of there to put them on. Yeah. I hate folding laundry. Yeah. Why would I take a job in retail? <laughs> it's like the stupid People come by, they like look at eight shirts Right, find and one that they're not going to buy. Your whole job retail is just to like fold all day. You just fold the same thing over and over and over again. Oh, yeah. What, that, what, that was, uh, my, what was the job? At least I think probably like the gap or something yeah, stupid gap. like that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just I hated it. <laughs> it's brutal. Uh, what was your largest non-poker wager? My largest non-poker wager was $5,000. But what was it for? Uh, the presidency. The t- 2016 presidency. <laughs> I you lost? lost. Yeah. I lost. I got a really good price, though, so I couldn't be upset. What were the odds? Uh, I got I – was, I was gambling five to win three. Mm-hmm. And at the time that we that made it – That seems like a huge win for you. At the time that we – I'll put it this way. A week before the election, Damn, I could have silver. sold the bet. <laughs> I could have sold the bet yeah. very easily for a, for a good profit. Of course. Um, yeah, so – uh, what is a talent you don't have that you wish you did? Um, music. Okay. I think I, I'll just like broad. Like I'd love to be able to like play guitar, play the drum. Mm-hmm. It's just like grab an instrument and just like quickly. I have a hearing problem, so I'm really tone deaf. But just to like <laughs> just grab an instrument and be able to like just like oh let's jam. Yeah. Like that would be I would love that. You have no skills whatsoever. I try to, but yeah. no. I mean, I, I own a guitar. <laughs> I own a guitar. My friend gave me a guitar, and I'm like trying. You just noodle on it. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. I mean, I have a harmonica mm-hmm. that my grandfather gave me that I love. I'm terrible. Yeah. But I mean, I would love to be able to like jam. Well, that you got hockey sort of... instead. Sorry. No, no. Hey, listen. I like I said, I'm not. I, I wouldn't change my life. I'm happy with where I am. But if you're mm-hmm. asking me, there's a skill that I would love to have. I just think the ability to like light a fire, sit outside, <laughs> and grab a guitar and sing some like James Taylor song. Oh yeah. That would just be cool, right? Yeah. Be that guy at the yeah, party. Yeah, like be that guy, exactly. <laughs> right? That guy always gets laid. Yeah, well, he did. He did. He, he did in college for sure. I mean, I could fast forward it to like whatever music is more appropriate to now. Uh, you'd have to whip out a laptop and play some if I grabbed, EDM, I, 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 I guess. I feel like if I grabbed the guitar and I sang some song that was more appropriate today, I'd still get laid. Yeah, it, it still works. Yeah. <laughs> Headphones on at the table, yes or no? Um... I think it's fine. Okay. And uh, I mean, as long as as long as your headphones aren't so loud that you can't hear anything. I mean, if you're that guy who has head, headphones on your table, and then you're like, it's your turn to act. Yeah. No, that's not okay. Mm-hmm. Or you have to be like, what did you say? Just turn your headphones down so you can hear both. If you can't, then no. And what are you listening to? Um, I would say 80% of the time I'm not, I'm not the headphone guy. Mm-hmm. But if there's somebody annoying at my table, there's somebody like me at the table. <laughs> it was not me, obviously. Sometimes I'll put them on, and depending on what mood I'm in, um, you know, anything from classic rock to chill James Taylor to Cat Stevens <laughs> to – I mean, I can get into, like, an R&B mode if I want to. I mean, okay. it depends. You're all over the place. I am. I'm totally all over the place. Do you have a favorite album? Uh, probably The River. Okay. Springsteen, probably. <laughs> I would imagine. I mean, there's so many. That's Probably. your Northeast roots coming in. Oh yeah, I'm totally Springsteen. I have a, <laughs> I have a, I have quotes from Springsteen song on my, <laughs> on my calf. I'll show you. Uh, hold on, where are they? There we go. Oh wow, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, a wedding. Our, my wife and our, our wedding song. Do you have any other ink? Uh, no, that's it. I, would, I want more though. Though mm-hmm. after I did this, I kind of want more. Yeah. Uh, my, my, uh, Just my get, youngest son. A, his my youngest son' your middle back. name is no. My young, <laughs> my youngest son's name is Silas Springsteen Tuckman. That's awesome. That was my, by the way, that's not my idea. That was my wife's idea. That's cool. And I was like, sure, I'm okay with it. The boss. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, favorite movie? Oh, man. You know, there's so many movies and it depends what genre, but I'll just throw Slapshot out there. Okay, yeah. Because it's, it's probably not my favorite movie, but I think it's like one of the best movies. I think it's one of the most underrated. Definitely one of the best hockey movies. It's the best hockey movie. You don't it's like Goon? It's, Goon is... No, no. Slapshot is... I'm Paul, a big Goon it's Paul fan. New, it's, Goon, it's a good movie, but it's like... <laughs> it's Paul Newman. Slapshot mm-hmm. is probably one of the most underrated sports comedies of all time. Yeah. And when people think of great sports comedies, they think of like Caddyshack and Major League. And, you know, they don't even... Like, people don't know Slapshot. Yeah. It's brilliant. If you've never seen Slapshot, do yourself a favor. Get Slapshot. Thank, thank me later. Yeah. Thank David this summer at the series. When yeah, yeah. Seen. No, it's, it's a great movie. It's not my favorite movie, but I'll just throw <laughs> that out there. Uh, do you have a celebrity doppelganger or growing up? Did people tell you you look like somebody? Corey Haim. 
Corey Haim. I'm yeah. not seeing Growing it. up. Okay. Growing up. Well, I mean, growing up, I was. I would need a floppier haircut. I was I like 11. I can show you pictures. I had really <laughs> floppy hair. Um, you know, I had like, I had the Jufro going on. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, Corey Haim was like a dead ringer. Then later on in life, um, um, why am I blanking on this guy's name? Um, uh, Ace Ventura. Uh, oh, that's two in a row. Jim Carrey. Yeah, Jim Carrey. Thank you. That's uh, all hilarious. the time. All the time, Jim Carrey. When, I guess um, I have big facial expressions and everything, but this was, I would say, Corey Haim was from like nine to 14. Mm-hmm. Jim Carrey was like 23 I to could like. I see you doing a face. 23 expression. to like 29. <laughs> I'll show you a picture that you can, if you want to, you can post it. This yeah. and you'll see what I'm talking about. Like 23 to 29, like Ace Ventura, like mm-hmm. totally. That was that was the that was thing. your Halloween costume go to. Yeah, I didn't even need to. I'm gonna just get this out while you do this. <laughs> That's funny. So you, um, can, you can you can comment on it while I I talk. Uh, well, I was just gonna say I just uh, interviewed Eric um, Rodewig for the podcast. I'm sorry to hear that. Things and- are desperate. <laughs> Times are desperate. Are you really? You're really just bringing up the he bottom had, of the barrel. He had some funny stories about uh, beating Helmuth heads up for a bracelet, um, but uh, yeah, he also was told that he had a Jim Carrey look, but his was more when he had a flat top during the uh, me, my, okay. me myself and Irene days. Right, right, right. Okay, I can see that. Anyway, that well, we, I'm end, find this uh, we end our podcast the same way every time. Do we? With a question from the random question generator. Random question generator. I like this. Okay. You ready? Go ahead. All right, speaking of movies, what movie would be greatly improved if it was made into a musical? Well, that's like every movie. Do you think every movie would be better if it yes. was a musical? I love musicals. Who doesn't like a musical? Oh, right okay, now, right what now, movie? Uh, Cats is in the news for getting being one of the worst. Shawshank time. Redemption. Wow. Yeah, that would be a greatly improved movie if it was. Imagine it. Think about it. It's already, I think, IMDb's number one movie of all time. Right, but think, think about how much be better, better it would be if it was a musical. <laughs> <laughs> this would be some dark songs. I, okay, fine. Star Wars. I mean, yeah. You wouldn't even need to change the, the music. Just add lyrics. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Space opera. Yeah. I think, mm-hmm. that's, yeah, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, David, for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Good luck in your game today. Okay. I hope I wasn't too boring. Thank you. No, that was great. Later. That's it. That is the show. Thank you once again to Tuck for the great stories you can follow david on social media at tuck on sports you can check out his website at tuck and finally since i know you love podcasts you can hear more of tuck with the under the gun podcast speaking of podcasts before you close this episode and skip to the next can i interest you in leaving a nice rating and review for poker stories It's right there if you scroll to the bottom of the podcast page in your app. Just leave us a tidy five-star rating and perhaps a few complimentary words and let us know about it with an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com. Do that and we will reward you with a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Follow us on Twitter at Card Player Media and also at poker underscore stories. Thanks for listening.